Good evening. Making Michigan. Uh, this is the Bentley Series on the History University of Michigan. I'm very So tonight, our topic is Poets at Michigan, Then and Now, and we are fortunate to be led through this topic by Cody Walker. I want to thank Cody for helping us attend to this part of Michigan history, which is often, I fear, uh, more neglected than it should be. And you're helping us fill a lacuna in the Making Michigan series that has been around for too long, so thank you. Uh, Cody Walker directs the University of Michigan English Department's undergraduate program in creative writing. He also directs the Bear River Writers Conference in Northern Michigan. The author of three poetry collections, including the self-styled uh, the, the self-styled No Child. His work appears in the Yale Review, the New Yorker, the New York Times Magazine, and two editions of the Best American Poetry Series. His awards include the James Boatwright III Prize for Poetry from Shenandoah, the Howard Mosher Short Fiction Prize from Hunger Mountain and residency fellowships from the University of Arizona Poetry Center, the A.D. Klamath Fund, and the Swanee Writers Conference. A longtime writer in residence in Seattle Arts and Lectures Writers in the Schools program, he was elected Seattle Poet Populist in 2007. In 2013, he co-edited a live at the Center Contemporary Poems from the Pacific Northwest. At the University of Michigan, Cody has been a UMS, UMS Mellon Fellow and the Michigan Rhodes Scholar, that's R-O-A-D-S, by the way, for those of you who don't know about the Michigan <laughs> Rhodes Scholars. Uh, it's a great program, actually. Uh, and he's now, he's about to become a fellow at the Institute for the Humanities. Cody has been at U of M since two, 2009. Previously, he was at the University of Washington. He holds a BA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, an MFA from the University of Arkansas, and a PhD from the University of Washington. So thank you, and please welcome Cody. <clears throat> Well, thank you, Gary. Uh, that was a little bit of this is your life. Um, this is, it's too loud, yeah? Is it? Yeah. Is it how do, what do I do? <laughs> what do I do? It's already, this talk is already ruined. Um, should I use a mic? Should I use a mic instead of this mic? Or is that? Just say random things and. Okay, okay. so now I get to say. Thank you, Gary. Um, I, I really appreciate being invited to be part of this lecture series. Um, it is a pleasure. Um, thank you, all y'all, for coming on this beautiful May evening. Um, I, w I was talking to a friend this morning who used to be a docent uh, at the observatory, and I asked him for any tips, and he said, well, just don't read to them. People don't like to be read to. So I'm not much going to read to you. I'm going to read poems to you, but I'm not going to read a 45-minute talk to you, but I am going to read a paragraph to you. Uh, just because I want to be sure I get this right. Um, the, um, so this, this topic, uh, Poets of Michigan, Then and Now, uh, is a topic that I have a tremendous amount of affection for. Um, the title of this lecture and, and conversation um, is also the title of a class I've taught three times at U of M in the winter and fall semesters of 2017, and then again over Zoom in the summer of 2021. It was originally a bicentennial theme semester class and credit for the idea for the class goes to Keith Taylor, an extraordinary Michigan poet himself, who sent me an email at some point saying, hey, you teach a lot of these poets anyway. Why don't you put them together for the bicentennial and get a little bit of course development funding in the process? Um, that sounded like a good idea, so I did it. And then I co-curated with Sigurd Anderson an exhibit at the Hatcher uh, Library, also called Poets of Michigan Then and Now. While all of this planning and preparation and teaching was happening, I was also working with Paul Diamond, uh, who wishes he could be here tonight, um, but has another engagement. Um, but Paul researching um, Robert Frost's and Theodore Retke's and W.H. Auden's time in Ann Arbor for his historical novel, The Bell of Two Arbors. Paul had the idea to put on a symposium. You, you realize why I had to write this out. There's a lot of layers. Uh, Paul had the idea to put on a symposium about poets who had spent time in Ann Arbor and he brought in me and Keith Taylor and Larry Goldstein to help out. Again, we called it Poets of Michigan, Then and Now. You come up with a good title, you stick with it. 
Uh, and it was a really lovely and well-attended event, one that deepened my understanding of what an important place Ann Arbor has been for poets over the past 100 years. Essays by Paul Diamond and Larry Goldstein that emerged from that symposium appeared in the winter 2018 issue of Michigan Quarterly Review, which was guest edited by Keith Taylor. And it's a fabulous issue. I wish I had copies I could distribute to everybody. Um, you should track it down. Um, and if you know anything about the Michigan Quarterly Review, you know that Larry Goldstein was the editor of the journal for over three decades, 32 years. He was a beloved editor. He was a life-changing teacher. He taught at U of M for 46 years, 1970 to 2016. He was a towering poet, um, a towering Michigan poet, I want to say, although he probably thought of himself more as a Los Angeles poet. And he left the earth a little over a month ago. So I want to dedicate this lecture, this conversation, to Larry Goldstein, a great poet and a mensch of a man. No history of poets at Michigan would be complete without him. So Larry Goldstein, with his hands together, I put my hands together to Larry. Um, I, I can't believe I'm giving this talk without being able to consult Larry. He's, he would be the first person I would consult before doing a thing like this. Um, colleague of Robert Hayden's, colleague of Donald Hall's, and just a tremendously wonderful guy. Um, OK, I'm going to give you a little bit of a map now uh, in terms of where we're headed for this talk. Um, it, as, I, as I told Gary, I tried to get it to 45 minutes. It's more like 51 minutes, maybe, although we've already, uh, we're already a few into that. Um, and uh, I'm going to move relatively chronologically uh, over the past 100 years in terms of the history of poets at Michigan. Uh, and by poets at Michigan, I mean maybe they taught here, maybe they, uh, they studied here, maybe they were just kind of popping in as a writer in residence. Um, but that history really begins with Robert Frost. Uh, and it begins with Frost here in uh, the 1921-22 uh, academic year as uh, the first uh, creative fellow uh, in the arts. Let me see if I have that fellow in the creative arts. Um, uh, he's here for a couple of years in the early 20s, then again uh, in the middle part of the 20s. They give him a new title. It is uh, Fellow in Letters, same job. Uh, he leaves in 25 and 26. Theodore Rutke comes in uh, as an undergraduate, so there are different generations. Rutke is here uh, from 25 to 29, uh, graduates, um, comes back a briefly. He uh, is back here and, here and there in the 1930s, uh, finally gets an MA in 36, and then he's on his way. Um, we move into the 1940s. We have W.H. Auden here for a single year, but it's a really important year, 1941-42. So we'll talk briefly about uh, where Auden was coming from, who he was as a poet at that, uh, at that time in history, and um, what his class was like. At least he taught this insane class uh, in 1941 and 42. Uh, one of his students was Robert Hayden. Uh, so Hayden was here as a graduate student. Uh, Hayden had, um, uh, had gone to what is now called Wayne State as an undergraduate, uh, was here as a graduate student from 1941 to 46. Uh, and we'll talk about, talk about, I guess we, uh, I'll go, we'll, I'll forget the slides for a moment, but we'll talk about Hayden, um, uh, who studied here in the 40s and then came back to teach from 1969 to 1980. So he's the one figure who both studied here and taught here uh, with a long break in the middle where he was at Fisk University in Tennessee teaching too many classes. Um, Frank O'Hara comes in the 50s. Frank O'Hara is here just for a single year like Auden, 1950-51. Uh, uh, it's an important year for O'Hara, so we'll touch on him briefly. Uh, and then we'll move into the 60s. Uh, Jane Kenyon uh, was studying here as an undergraduate in the late 1960s uh, as a graduate student, got an MA and I believe it was 1972, uh, and then hangs on for a few more years before she and her husband, Donald Hall, uh, take off for New Hampshire. Uh, so that's the the then in this po poets, Michi poets of Michigan now and, and then, then and now? <laughs> what do we call this? Then and now, sorry, that's the then. Uh, the now, uh, we're gonna go up a few decades, uh, go forward a few decades, and I wanna uh, pause at the achievement of several mid-career poets, um, folks who are in their mid, late 40s, early 
50s, uh, so they include Victoria Chang, Jaswinder Bellina, and Francine J. Harris, and I'll introduce you to each of them uh, a little bit later. So that's where we're headed, um, but as I said, the story of uh, poets at Michigan begins with Robert Frost, and much of what I know about Frost's time at Michigan comes from this fantastic pamphlet that um, was put out by the ben Bentley Historical Library, so that seemed a very fitting thing to bring to your attention here. Uh, it was um, put out by a um, past director of the Bentley, Robert M. Warner. And I'm a little bit now like one of those teachers who isn't sure he's that good of a teacher, so he brings in cupcakes, something like that. Um, I brought in these pamphlets, and I think I have almost maybe one for everybody. I think I have 29 of them here. Uh, these are hard to find. This, this is, these are long out of print, and I acquired a bunch of them. Uh, a handful of years ago. So if anybody would like one, uh, again, I have 29 of them. It's a, it's a really, really fun and engaging and you know, sort of short, 40-ish pages, uh, a 40-page intro into, um, into what the, the various machinations that brought Frost uh, to, to the Ann Arbor campus in uh, 1921. Uh, President Burton uh, brought, him, brought him here, and we'll maybe talk a little bit more about the background uh, later of that um, uh, you know, of, 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 those, of those years. Um, but I want to advance the slide here. And here, this is where my eyes betray me, so I've got to come over here a little bit. Uh, so here's Frost looking at it as, uh, as I said, the, he came here in 1920, the 1921-22 academic year. He looked back at it as, as he says, a year to wonder at. Um, no, he did not have to teach. He was, this was a this writer-in-residence job was one that didn't quite exist at the time. Uh, Burton, along with a, um, the then president of Miami of Ohio, Raymond Hughes, both had this idea that maybe, um, maybe this would be a good thing, to have a creative person on campus without a lot of responsibilities, but their presence would be helpful in some ways. They would gain something. The university uh, would gain something. Um, the um, Bur President Burton said, um, uh, nothing would do more to leaven the increasing materialism of the American university. Remember, this is back in 1920, 1921. Nothing would do more to leaven the increasing materialism of the American university than to have a cr great creative artist working on the campus. Um, a lesson for our current moment, perhaps. Um, you can see on the screen a little bit of what Frost thought about it. He said he, was, uh, he had no official responsibilities but was kept pretty di busy dining out and talking informally on all occasions, from club meetings to memorial services on the athletic field to decoration day. He says, I have felt nonsensical at times, but it's the first year of an experiment. We want to find out if every college couldn't keep one artist or poet, and the artist or poet in college be the better for the mutual obligation. Uh, the first year he was here was considered a great success. Uh, he, was, he was riding high, he's in his mid-40s at this point, becoming famous, not, not the Robert Frost that we know right now, uh, but an important poet. Um, and he was meeting with the students who were running the literary magazines, the Whimsies, later the Inlander, the Outlander. Uh, he was having lots of meals, he was reading, he was organizing readings, he was bringing well-known poets to campus. Um, there was a lot of energy there, it was, it was thought to be a success. The um, a local drugstore put out um, a little um, chocolate candy called the, it was, uh, they said ice cream surrounded by chocolate called the Frostbite, thus the title of this, uh, of this pamphlet, Frostbite and Frostbark, his bark is no worse than his bite, uh, bookstore said next to the, uh, next to the drugstore. Um, and, um, and so they wanted to bring it back. He was, you know, they paid him $5,000, said do what you will. He did a good job. Came back the second year. It didn't go quite as well. He had other obligations. He wasn't quite out and about in the same way, but it still went well enough uh, that a few years later, there was a campaign to bring him back one more time. Um, and the idea at this point was this would maybe be a perpetual fellowship uh, that would you know, continue on every year. Maybe he would hold it. Maybe it would rotate. Um, but what happened in that, uh, that third stint uh, was that President Burton died. Uh, he died young, he died, died you know, prematurely, 50 I think he was. And uh, with his death went a lot of the enthusiasm for this uh, perpetual fellowship. Uh, so, that, so Frost's final year wasn't, you know, kind of didn't have the same sort of energy that, um, that uh, the previous years did. Um, 
between those two visits, between, between the 1921 and the 22 and then the 25 visit, um, he came out, he published New Hampshire. It won, it won the Pulitzer Prize. Frost would go on to win four Pulitzer Prizes. This is number one. And I, I love the fact that he called the book New Hampshire, he dedicated it to Vermont and Michigan. All three of those states were you know, important to him at, at, at the time, but he's also, he seems a little bit like a, I don't know, like a, maybe a politician who you know, was wearing a Yankees hat at one event, and a Mets hat at another, and then a Red Sox hat at the third, just trying to please everybody. Um, but anyway, we, we got a little bit of the dedication of that book, which has a lot of poems in it uh, that you would recognize. This is, this is a major, major book, maybe his best book. Um, to back up just a moment, when he was thinking about coming back for that third year, the 1925-26 uh, year, this is from a little bit of digging in special collections that I did a few years ago. I came across these handwritten letters that he had written to uh, de department chair Strauss, the then de uh, chair of the English department, uh, in which he says, handsomely was the way to do this thing if it was going to be done, and handsomely you have all certainly done it. I am still dazed with the pleasure you have given, given me. I begin to wonder if I shall be able to wait till next year to take up my desk in your office. I may have I may have to come out for a special desk warming beforehand. My mind is already out there with you. As you know, I have a weakness for ideas, particularly in education. The idea of the fellowship rouses the very teacher in me. Again, he had no teaching obligations, but was just there to sort of um, you know, be a semi-big man on campus. Uh, moreover, I am not averse to a great big gift once in a lifetime when it comes my way, and I rather like honors. But what exerts the main attraction in Ann Arbor is simply friends. You don't need to be told it, but I'm telling you just the same. My best to you and your family, and believe me, ever yours, Robert Frost. And that believe me, so it sounds like Donald Trump there for a moment. I want to forgive him uh, for that. Um, but he was enthusiastic about coming back. As I said, the last year, yeah, it, was, it was OK. It wasn't, wasn't all it could be. But one of the really lovely things he did is he gave, this was, the Inlander was one of several literary magazines that the undergraduate students turned out. Uh, and he gave them one of his, you know, sort of, you know, I don't know if I want to call it a major poem, but it's not a minor poem, even though it's called The Minor Bird. It's a fairly well-known poem by Frost. He gave, the, he gave them first publication rights, uh, which is really a big deal for an undergraduate literary magazine. Uh, so this was published in 1926 uh, in uh, The Inlander. And um, if I can get in the right position, I'll read it to you. It goes like this. The Minor Bird. I have wished a bird would fly away and not sing by my house all day, have clapped my hands at him from the door when it seemed as if I could bear no more. The fault may partly have been in me. The bird was not to blame for his key, and I own there must be something wrong in ever wanting to silence song. So, so there's a poem from Frost from that time. Um, as I said, a, a, a good poem. I don't think a great poem. I want to go to a great poem. Um, Fire and Ice, also, also written during these years when he was bouncing uh, between uh, Michigan and the, and the East Coast. Uh, you know this poem, probably. Fire and Ice. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. God, I love that would suffice. That the, 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 the shrugging irony uh, at the end of that is, is, is so Frost-like. I would, I would ex explicate this poem until we ran out of time, except that Frost taught me not to ex explicate his poems. Uh, one of my favorite things he ever said, here's Frost as a fresh-faced guy and the more familiar older guy, he'd, re he'd recited one of his poems, was asked to explain it. What do you want me to do, he replied. Say it over again in worser English. Uh, that's a line I quote all the time with my students. Um, and we try to honor it to some extent, but sometimes I'll be in workshop and a poem, just the dramatic situation isn't at all clear. And I'll say, can you just sort of describe this poem again for us in worser English just for a moment? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a handy little um, kind of a aphorism. Or, uh, the, the, the other line, it, it's my second favorite line from Frost's prose. Um, my favorite line from his prose, one I had reason to quote to uh, a third grade classroom just a few days ago, is, no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader. 
Um, again, no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader. The writer can catch himself, herself, their self in the, in the, in the act of surprise. That, that surprise is contagious. The reader, the reader feels it as well. Um, I, I, it's, it's certainly what I, what I aim to try to do as a poet. And what I feel when I'm reading a, a great poem by Frost, I, I feel it happen, that associative leap that you, you know just pleased him as much as it pleases you. Um, one last uh, remark on Frost before we uh, move on uh, to our next poet. Um, <clears throat> he was at a gathering uh, with, uh, with President Burton. Uh, and Burton, again, who was you know, described by, um, by Robert M. Warner as really the hero of the story of bringing Frost to campus during those years in the, in the 20s, uh, Burton remarks to a gathered crowd at the dinner table, I suppose, Robert Frost may be even more popular than football coach Fielding Yost, to which Frost replied, let's put that to the test. Schedule a reading for me at the same time as a home football game. More than 30,000 will be cheering at Ferry Field, but Hill Auditorium will be empty since even I will be at the game. So he had a, he had a sense of humor about where he landed in the, in the pecking order. I'm going to mention his return to Ann Arbor a little bit later when we talk about Theodore Retke. Um, but I, I just want to say real quickly, um, he, um, somewhere in the midst of these books, I have a, a kind of Frost's, uh, Fro Frost on Campus, I believe, I believe it's called. And he, uh, when he's speaking in Michigan in 1962, this pains me, he predicts, again, 1962, a long time ago, he predicts a gentler interest in the fine things and a passing out of the boorish. The boorish, we'll call it. Just the crude and rude and go after everything. So thank God we passed away from all that, and uh, things are things are as they are. Um, okay, we're gonna we're gonna move now to Theodore Rutke. Uh, Rutke, as I mentioned before, arrives as just the same year that Frost leaves. So kind of a passing of the baton. They don't they end up being friends later on. They don't meet each other at this time. Uh, Rutke's eighteen. You know, Frost again is nearing fifty. Um, Rutke is uh, from Saginaw, Michigan, as some of you probably know, which I'll say something about in a moment. Uh, he comes, comes down to Ann Arbor. When he's a sophomore, he writes an essay uh, called Some Self-Analysis, in which he says, I have faith in myself. I'm either going to be a good writer or a poor fool. So, spoiler alert, he becomes a good writer. Uh, as I said before, he graduates in 29, then he for about a millisecond, takes, uh, takes some uh, uh, classes in the law school, takes some uh, literature classes towards his MA here and there, not a, not a whole lot, but finally does get an MA uh, in, in 1936. Um, he goes, after, after, after 1936, he goes on to Penn State, where he is both um, a professor of English and the tennis coach. Um, he, was a, he was a big guy. He said at one point, I look like a beer salesman, but I'm a poet. Um, but he was a great athlete. He was, he, was, he was light on his feet. I have a, let me see if I have the, my notes here. Yeah, he, when he was, uh, in, uh, he won a Saginaw City tournament as a teenager, tennis tournament. Um, and then in 1927, he finished second at U of M in intramural singles. So the second best player on campus who wasn't, I guess, on the actual varsity team. Um, I was playing tennis this morning. And I was just imagining myself as Rutke, knowing I was going to be talking about Rutke later and trying to, you know, what would Rutke do at this moment and trying to feel light on my feet. It worked for about 20 minutes, then, then not, not so well. Um, I'm, Rutke, as I said, grew up in Saginaw. His, um, his dad and uncle ran uh, a greenhouse. The, there's the cart that they would, uh, or not cart, I guess, but the car they would uh, deliver flowers in. That is the house as it now stands, or at least as it uh, stood a few years ago when I paid it a visit. Um, you can still go there. You can go up to Saginaw, visit the Rutke House. There is an organization called the Friends of Rutke who um, bought it and have kept it going. And uh, it's uh, something of a museum inside. They host readings, things like that. It's really a lovely space. If you're at all interested in Rutke, I'd, I'd recommend a, uh, a visit. Um, when he was here, and I don't know why we have these, but for some reason we have doodles that he, um, you know, sort of, uh, sort of doodled when he was at um, at U of M, and you can I don't know how well you can see them, but um, 
kind of sounds like Rutke, the throbbing nerves, uh, the ambient descending air, do-dazzled. Uh, this is somebody who, as an undergraduate, is interested in words and playing with words and filling, um, filling up uh, you know, notebooks and scraps of paper with words. Um, Rutke said uh, at one point, I think of myself as a poet of love, a poet of praise, and I wish to be read aloud. So this next poem I have up here is uh, neither a poem of uh, love nor a poem of praise, but it is a great, uh, or at least a very fun poem to read out loud. I, I had the chance to read it out loud to a group of uh, Rutkeites in Saginaw a few years ago. Uh, and I used to read it to my kids all the time. They're here right now. They're, they don't need me to read them poems anymore. But when they were little babies and uh, weren't going to sleep, one of the nice things about being a poet and, and having read a lot of poetry is a few poems lodge in your head. So you know, you can say poems to them. So I said this poem to my kids, Zia and Ani, lots and lots and lots of times. So if they grow up to be very weird, this is perhaps why. Um, my, favorite, my favorite poem by Rutke, Dinky. Oh, what's the weather in a beard? It's windy there and rather weird. And when you think the sky has cleared, why, there is dirty Dinky. Suppose you walk out in a storm with nothing on to keep you warm and then step barefoot on a worm, of course, it's dirty dinky. As I was crossing a hot, hot plain, I saw a sight that caused me pain. You asked me before, I'll tell you again, it looked like dirty dinky. Last night you lay a sleeping no, the room was 35 below. The sheets and blankets turned to snow, he'd got in, dirty dinky. You'd better watch the things you do. You'd better watch the things you do. You're part of him, he's part of you. You may be dirty dinky. So again, we'll, we'll see how they turn out. Um, but um, uh, Rutke is um, an incredibly important 20th century American poet. He goes on to teach at the University of Washington for many years, which, as Gary mentioned earlier, is where I did my PhD. And I, lived, I lived there for a dozen years. I think of myself in some ways still as a Seattleite or a Seattle poet. Uh, I used to go to a bar occasionally called the Blue Moon Tavern that Rutke frequented. Uh, and right behind it, they have uh, something called Rutke Muse, M-E-W-S, a uh, little alleyway behind the bar, which is meant to call uh, the M-U-S-C spelling uh, as, as well. Um, here he is coming back. So he came back a couple of times. He tried to get a job, I think, four times, according to Alan Seeger, his biographer, four times at U of M. Each time it didn't work out. But he was invited back in 1960 to uh, give the Hopwood Lecture, and then in 1962 to uh, receive a doctorate, uh, an honorary doctorate in letters. And one of the great things about this picture is he, so there, I think that's maybe Harlan Hatcher, the president. Um, he's receiving, Rutke's receiving his doctorate, and there's Robert Frost right there under the, under the handshake looking on because Frost was also here to receive an honorary you know, doc doctorate of some sort. Um, I, I love this picture. It's also a little bit of a heartbreaking picture. This is 1962. Frost is in his late 80s. Rutke's in his mid 50s. The following year, both will die. So uh, Frost dies on January 29th of uh, 1963. Uh, he's 88. Um, but Rutke, who's only 55, dies dies the next year as well in um, Bainbridge Bainbridge Island outside of Seattle. He's um, probably had a heart attack while he was in a swimming pool and uh, did not survive the swim. So, and that, if you, I don't think it's publicly, uh, it, it's, not, it's not for tourists, but there, I've been told that that pool has been filled in uh, with sand and rocks and it's now kind of a Zen garden, which seems right for a, a seeker like Rutke. Um, the, um, right next to it, um, if we kind of go forward of a whole bunch of years, this is from the Rutke house up in Saginaw, this uh, picture that I took. And it's uh, in 2012, the US Postal um, Service uh, honored 10 poets. And uh, several of them are poets with Michigan ties. You'll see Joseph Brodsky uh, in the upper right. Brodsky was here in the uh, early, mid 1970s. W.H. Auden was instrumental in bringing him here. Uh, you'll see Robert Hayden, who we're going to talk about in just a moment. Uh, one over from the top right, and then Theodor Rutke down there in the bottom right as well. So three, three out of ten, not bad. Um, that's that's um, 2012, and now I'm going to jump forward a full decade 
And hey, it's a Rutke poetry birthday party. Uh, this is from last year, uh, 2022. You see he's, he wears the hat well. Um, today is Rutke's birthday. He's 115 today. So happy birthday, Ted Rutke. You're looking good. Uh, in, up in Saginaw, they usually do some kind of uh, event for him, some sort of celebration like, like this. I couldn't, my little slight bit of Googling didn't find anything this year, but I'm sure somebody up there is raising a glass to him, and they had apparently a three-day celebration last year. Um, so that is Theodore Rutke. Now we're going to jump, uh, jump forward a little bit to uh, W.H. Auden. As I said, this takes us into the 1940s. Rutke and Auden end up being friends, by the way. They, uh, Auden goes to Rutke's wedding, things like that. But um, Auden, um, Auden was here. In 1941, the 1941-42 academic year, he was riding about as high as a poet can ride high at this point in life. He's only in his early 30s. He's 33, maybe, maybe 34. Um, but he has just published this book, Another Time, uh, which I, is as good a single volume poetry collection written in English as I think we have from the 20th century. It has all sorts of poems that um, if you, you know, have read a little bit of poetry before, you'll recognize um, Lay Your Sleeping Head, My Love, Musée des Beaux-Arts, As I Walked Out One Evening, uh, Funeral Blues, Roman Wall Blues, Epitaph on a Tyrant, The Unknown Citizen, Refugee Blues, In Memory of W.B. Yeats, uh, September 1st, 1939, the, the poem that has that famous line, we must love one another or die, all of this in a single volume of poetry that he puts out in 1940. Uh, he has left England, where he's from, uh, in 1939, come to the US, um, to escape in some ways the burden of his reputation. Uh, we, we should all have such problems, right? Uh, but he was thought to be really the, you know, the leading, leading, figure, uh, leading figure within among poets of his generation. Uh, and he wanted a different context. Also, as we know, um, you know, in 1939 in Europe, uh, things were burbling in, in ways that uh, made, made somebody like Auden think, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go elsewhere. So he comes to the US, needs to make a living, um, and gets a post in Ann Arbor, again, for the 41-42 academic year. Um, the, I'm going to go forward here. Um, just to give, some of you, I'm sure, know his, know his poetry. Some of you may know it well. But if you don't, I wanted to just give you a, just a, a taste. So this is Refugee Blues, uh, again, from another time. Uh, as you can see, my scrawl on the bottom of the page there. It was written in March of 1939. This is a poem that um, I read to uh, my students in uh, the winter of 2017, right after Trump's inauguration and right after the so-called Muslim ban, and maybe I'll say something about that in a moment. Um, this is a sadly timeless poem, but it was written in 1939. It goes like this, Refugee Blues. Say this city has 10 million souls. Some are living in mansions, some are living in holes. Yet there's no place for us, my dear. Yet there's no place for us. Once we had a country and we thought it fair. Look in the atlas and you'll find it there. We cannot go there now, my dear. We cannot go there now. In the village churchyard, there grows an old yew. Every spring, it blossoms anew. Old passports can't do that, my dear. Old passports can't do that. The consul banged the table and said, if you've got no pa passport, you're officially dead. But we are still alive, my dear. But we are still alive. Went to a committee. They offered me a chair, asked me politely to return next year. But where shall we go today, my dear? But where shall we go today? Came to a public meeting. The speaker got up and said, if we let them in, they will steal our daily bread. He was talking of you and me, my dear. He was talking of you and me. Thought I heard the thunder rumbling in the sky. It was Hitler over Europe saying, they must die. Oh, we were in his mind, my dear. Oh, we were in his mind. Saw a poodle in a jacket fastened with a pin. Saw a door opened and a cat let in. But they weren't German Jews, my dear. But they weren't German Jews. Went down the harbor and stood upon the quay. Saw the fish swimming as if they were free. Only 10 feet away, my dear. Only 10 feet away. Walked through a wood, saw the birds in the trees. They had no politicians and sang at their ease. They weren't the human race, my dear. They weren't the human race. 
Dreamed I saw a building with a thousand floors, a thousand windows, and a thousand doors. Not one of them was ours, my dear. Not one of them was ours. Stood on a great plain in the falling snow. Ten thousand soldiers marched to and fro, looking for you and me, my dear, looking for you and me. So, if you're someone who says, I don't really get poetry, well, you get this, right? You understand the poem's pain, the poem's ironies, and you almost certainly understand how the poem might apply to any number of situations beyond its 1939 setting. It's heartbreakingly timeless. Um, I, I read this, as I said, to a, a class, the, the Michigan Poets class, then and now, uh, in the winter of 2017. And um, I, I hate to be the kind of liberal professor who just sort of you know, waits for everyone else to nod along with him. But I, I think I fell into that occasionally during uh, those early months of 2017. But there was one person who definitely was not nodding along. Uh, because he wrote in his course evaluations, uh, I can't believe the professor likened Trump to Hitler. Um, and um, I don't know that I did. And in fact, I have a poem in, in this book called The Trumpiad that talks about how Trump and Hitler are unalike. Uh, it's a four-line poem. Maybe I'll read it later if we have time. Um, anyway, that is Refugee Blues. Uh, Auden was a great poet of uh, displacement. A uh, great poet of empathy. He's also a great love poet. And I, God, I wish we had time to read this. We don't. Um, so I want you all, if you don't know the poem, as I walked out one evening, jot it down, Google it when you get home, read it. Better yet, read it out loud. Um, fabulous, fabulous poem that works in three voices with a narrator, uh, a lover. You can decide if the lover is naive or not, and the voice of time, the clocks, uh, who tell the lover what's what. Um, as I said, when Auden was here in 41 and 42, uh, he was teaching. This was a teaching gig. He, um, unlike, unlike Frost's, and he taught this class that some, somebody unearthed the syllabus for it a few years ago, and it went viral. I think it was on the Paris Review uh, blog, and then people started passing it around. And the reason they did is because it is insane. Uh, it, it, and in this wonderfully aspirational way, this is a two-credit course. Uh, called Fate and the Individual in European Literature. It's an undergraduate class. He led a few grad students in as well. Two credits, 30-ish uh, 30, 30 books on the syllabus, over 6,000 pages. As you can see there, all of the Divine Comedy, lots of Aeschylus and Sophocles, a bunch of Shakespeare, uh, Goethe, Kierkegaard, uh, the Brothers Karamazov, Moby Dick, all of these works that these days we would take almost any of them and build a single book, build a seminar around a single book. He said, just read everything. Um, and uh, you can see at the top there, the class met in 2215 20, Angel Hall, instructor Whiston Auden. When I was teaching this class, this Michigan Poets class over Zoom a few years ago, I really felt the absence of being able to bring the students to the second floor of Angel Hall and show them this is where Auden taught. I, I miss being able to say, you know, this is a classroom. Maybe Jen, Jane Kenyon took a class here. Maybe Robert Hayden taught a class here. So I, I went down to the second floor, wearing my mask, uh, with early Auden. He looked something like, would have looked something like that at the time, and took a picture and sent it to them. So during, during high COVID, we, we did what we could. Um, so anyway, that um, I think I'll leave that. Um, leave Auden there. One of Auden's students, his greatest student, uh, certainly, was Robert Hayden. Uh, Hayden, as I mentioned earlier, um, did his uh, BA at De Detroit City College, which we now know is Wayne State University. Then he worked uh, on the Federal Writers Project uh, for a little while, and then came to U of M in 1941. Um, he um, Let's, let's just go forward here. Uh, at the end of that year, he was studying with Auden. He was much influenced by Auden. Um, they stayed friends for, for decades. And um, he submitted to the Hopwood uh, Awards, which some of you may know about. Um, it's uh, uh, their awards, which started in 1931. Uh, Avery Hopwood left, uh, the playwright Avery Hopwood left some money to the university. And they have, um, 
you know, my, my students, both undergraduates and graduates around the time of the Hopwood uh, contest announcements, they are very nervous. Everyone looks kind of awful and pulling out their hair. So I'm not always sure it's such a great thing to compete uh, with your classmates for awards like this. Yet, when we look back, it's sort of nice to see who won them, including Robert Hayden. Won the major award in poetry in 1942, and when I was going through the archives of the, the, in special collections, I was so charmed to find out that Marianne Moore was one of the judges. I, I hadn't known that. Um, and I found this letter from Moore where she thanks uh, Roy Cowden for uh, asking her to judge the contest, for paying her $75 to judge the contest. Folks get a lot more now. And she says, I'm delighted that Robert Hayden and Elmer S. Moon received awards. The longer I have thought about their work, since reporting to you on the contest material, the more strongly I have hoped they would be encouraged. Um, Hayden was indeed encouraged. And if I can just make kind of a real quick uh, detour, sidetrack uh, from this, I was, so I was going through all the, in special uh, archives, going through the Hopwood correspondence. Almost every famous writer that you can imagine in the 20th century was contacted at some point to be a judge. Many said yes. Some said no, some said no in kind of comic ways. One said yes and no, uh, and that's Dorothy Parker. So this is in the third year of the contest, um, 1934. She was contacted. She replied by Western Union, uh, she'll be so glad to serve on Poetry Committee. Stop my address, blah, 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 Dorothy Parker. Then two months later, she writes again, sorry and discouraged, but cannot feel in conscience that any poems or group of poems of the disheartening array sent me is worthy of any award mention or consideration, whatever, stop, naturally can accept no remuneration for my services, stop, returning typescripts immediately, and letter to you follows, mainly to ask you, what is the matter with those young people, stop, again, sorry, discouraged, but thank you for wanting me as a judge, Dorothy <laughs> Parker, so there, you know, that's, that's the, the, the yes and the no, doesn't, doesn't happen too often. Um, okay, back to, back to Robert Hayden, I'm going to share just a couple of quick poems by Hayden. This is one I love because it's, it's so short, um, but every, every word feels almost carved, chiseled. Uh, the, the, he's so attentive to the sounds. And this is a poem called Snow. He lived in Michigan for half his life, right? Uh, snow smooths and burdens, endangers, hardens, erases, revises, extemporizes vistas of lunar solitude, builds, embellishes a mood. And Hayden was a poet who I think often was looking outward. You still feel the, you know, the, the temperament, the sensibility of a, a, of a speaker in this poem, but he's not, you know, he's not looking inward so much as he's looking outward. He's not returning to the past so much. He says at one point, um, if I can get my notes straight here, um, reticence has its aesthetic value too. This is a poem that feels uh, reticent in, in ways that I appreciate, that create interesting ironies. Uh, he did, however, sometimes look inward and sometimes return to his past. Uh, and he did this most famously in a poem I'm imagining many of you know, Those Winter Sundays. This is one of the most anthologized poems uh, written by an American, anyway, of the 20th century. Um, I, I have a, this is a broadside or a poster that Wolverine Press Fritz Swanson and Wolverine Press put together uh, for the English department uh, in the fall. I think he made 100 copies of it. Uh, so I got one, and then I framed it, and it's got glass in it. I couldn't find a way to photograph it without getting a little bit of a reflection of my office. And then I thought, well, the poem ends with the, a metaphorical office or offices, so maybe that's fine. Um, but I'll read it to you. Those winter Sundays. Sundays, too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue-black cold, then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather made banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'd call, and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house, speaking indifferently to him who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know, what did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? I, 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 I'm not going to say anything about that poem in worse or English, but I, I will say that's a poem that has uh, meant a lot to me, um, in, including recently. 
Um, so we'll go forward one more, you know, just because of the time. I'm going to skip reading this poem, but I'll, I'll just say quickly that if you pick up a copy, uh, we have it here someplace, um, of uh, the, why am I not seeing it? Um, the selected poems of, um, of Hayden, there it is, uh, collected poems of Hayden, actually. The first poem in the, in the collection is The Diver. It's a poem uh, in which uh, Hayden follows a diver to the bottom of the sea. So he's still part of the earth, but he's almost as far away from the earth as he can be and still be of the earth. The penultimate poem is this one, Astronauts. So here he's looking at astronauts. They're not at the bottom of the sea, but they're up in space, still slightly connected to the Earth. They can see, see down, but, you know, away, away, away. And then in the final poem in, in this collection uh, called American Journal, Hayden imagines uh, or takes on the persona of a spaceman, a visitor from, you know, a far galaxy who's here to kind of infiltrate uh, and study us, uh, find out what he can find out about human civilization. And thinking about that, I just feel like that, that feels like Hayden. That feels like somebody who always felt a little bit removed from whatever the main current was. Uh, you can attribute that to systemic racism. You can attribute that uh, to the fact that his vision was very poor. He wore kind of Coke bottle glasses that he was teased a lot about when he was young and wasn't able to play sports and things like that. Um, but, but, you know, he was always um, what Walt Whitman called much earlier, both in and out of the game, both in and out of the game and watching and wondering at it. And that feels to me like the, it's always felt to me like the perfect artistic stance in general, and it feels very much like Hayden's stance. So I'll show you the, the ending of that poem, American Journal, the Spaceman poem. Uh, he's, this is the Spaceman kind of reporting about, uh, you know, logging in. Uh, he says, exert greater caution. Twice have aroused suspicion. Return to the ship until rumors of humanoids from outer space, so their scoffing media voices termed us, had been laughed away. My crew and I laughed too, of course. Confess I am curiously drawn, unmentionable, to, to the Americans. Doubt I could exist among them for long, however. Psychic demands far too severe. Much violence, much that repels. I am attracted nonetheless. Their variousness, their ingenuity, their elan vital, and that something, essence, quiddity, I cannot penetrate or name. But damn, did he try. Uh, so in, in, the, in the 70s, as, as I said, he was teaching here. Um, he began to be recognized in all the ways that he should have been recognized all uh, along. He served two terms as what was then called poetry consultant to the Library of Congress. That's a position we now call poet laureate. Um, and he uh, taught here until he died, too young, in his mid-late 60s, um, in, in 1980. Uh, if we go forward uh, 10 years, we see the university uh, doing right by him, uh, a multi-day celebration of his poetry with jazz saxophone and dance and choreography and, and surely lots of uh, poetry. Uh, as I said before, in 2012, he ends up on a US postal stamp. That's pretty good. Um, and then just this past fall, I, I mentioned that the broadside of those Winter Sundays was made by Wolverine Press for an English, apart English department event. What that was, was we renamed our, the English department renamed its um, meeting room, the place where we do lectures like this and have department meetings and whatnot, renamed it the Robert Hayden Room. Uh, we brought in, brought in uh, poets and folks who had you know, interesting connections to Hayden, had those broadsides of those Winter Sundays uh, available and, um, you know, forever more, I, I suppose, I hope anyway, uh, when the English department calls a meeting, we will get together in the Robert Hayden room, which is a, a helpful way to keep his legacy alive. Um, okay, we're going to jump from uh, Hayden here in the 40s to Frank O'Hara. I'm going to pick up the pace uh, a little bit. O'Hara was here 50 to 51, got an MA. Um, O'Hara was always destined for New York. Uh, New York was where he belonged. He knew it. Uh, he was, you know, grew up in a small town in Massachusetts, did a little stop in Ann Arbor, but he was looking to get a move on uh, and, and went to New York after his year in Ann Arbor. But the year that he was here was kind of a 
from a poetry perspective anyway, a really wonderful year. I read his Hopwood award-winning manuscript in special collections, and I just again and again thought, I know that poem, I know that poem. It, this is not apprentice work. These are poems that uh, include many that he comes to be known by. Um, he won $800 uh, for, for this manuscript in 1951. I did a little bit of Googling and, was, and found out that's 9,500 by today's uh, measure, so that's not bad. And I wanted to share with you a, a short poem from his manuscript, partly because I like this poem, partly because it has some of that, uh, oh, the exuberance uh, of, uh, of much of O'Hara's work. Uh, and it's also one that often gets anthologized. Uh, it's called Today. Oh. Kangaroos, sequins, chocolate sodas, you really are beautiful. Pearls, harmonicas, jujubes, aspirins, all the stuff they've always talked about still make a poem a surprise. These things are with us every day, even on beachheads and beers. They do have meaning. They're strong as rocks. So that comes again from his uh, from his Hopwood Award winning manuscript. It shows up in a in a book soon afterwards. He goes off to New York, becomes friends with artists and poets, Larry Rivers, John Ashbery, James Schuyler, Kenneth Koch, um, and um, lives the life he was destined to live. Uh, if you go to my office on the fifth floor of Angel Hall, I don't know why you would, but if you if you were to, uh, you'd find this poem on the bulletin board outside the outside the door. It's my favorite O'Hara poem. He wrote it 11 years after he was here, so it's not a, a, a Michigan poem, um, but I thought I'd share it with you. Lana Turner has collapsed. I was trotting along, and suddenly it started raining and snowing, and you said it was hailing, but hailing hits you on the head hard, so it was really snowing and raining, and I was in such a hurry to meet you, but the traffic was acting exactly like the sky, and suddenly I see a headline, Lana Turner has collapsed. There is no snow in Hollywood. There is no rain in California. I've been to lots of parties and acted perfectly disgraceful, but I never actually collapsed. Oh, Lana Turner, we love you. Get up. So there is the great Frank O'Hara and you know, the poet he was, um, he was bound to be. Um, we're going to move now to the 1960s. Uh, and then into the 1970s with uh, Jane Kenyon and Jane Kenyon's dog. Um, Kenyon is the only poet we're discussing today who actually grew up in Ann Arbor, kind of the outskirts of Ann Arbor. She went to Pioneer High School. She was a classmate of Iggy Pop. Uh, and then she came, uh, came to U of M in the late 60s, got a BA, then an MA, um, married her professor, as people sometimes did, I suppose sometimes still do, Donald Hall, and they stuck around until the mid-70s and then traveled, uh, traveled east. Um, Kenyon was um, in some ways in Hall's shadow maybe at that time. I think at this point, as a Hall was a, was a kind of a force of nature and a, and a real man of letters and wrote uh, all sorts of helpful things of, during his many, many years on Earth. But I think among poets, Kenyon is the poet uh, among the two that poets return to. Uh, not that it needs to be a contest, but, um, but, but, but Kenyon's reputation has grown over the years. Um, she died young. She died at 48. She, she got leukemia, uh, could not recover from it. Um, she wrote a number of poems that sort of Thought of that. I think this is a pre-diagnosis poem. I think, if I'm remembering it right. Uh, but she still has mortality on her mind. So this is a representative poem by Kenyon called "Otherwise." I got out of bed on two strong legs. It might have been otherwise. I ate cereal, sweet milk, ripe flawless peach. It might have been otherwise. I took the dog uphill to the birch wood. All morning I did the work I love. At noon I lay down with my mate. It might have been otherwise. We ate dinner together at a table with silver candlesticks. It might have been otherwise. I slept in a bed in a room with paintings on the walls and planned another day just like this day. But one day, I know it will be otherwise. And I'll share one more poem from Kenyon, partly because it mentions Retke and partly because I love the ending so much. And then we'll very quickly move to uh, recent poets. Um, Afternoon in the house, this one's called. It's quiet here. The cats sprawl, each in a favored place. The geranium leans this way to see if I'm writing about her. Head all petals, brown stalks, and those green fans. So you see, I am writing about you. I turn on the radio, wrong. 
Let's not have any noise in this room except the sound of a voice reading a poem. The cats request the meadow, mo meadow mouse by Theodore Gretke. The house settles down on its haunches for a doze. I know you are with me, plants and cats, and even so, I'm frightened, sitting in the middle of perfect possibility. I love, I love imagining Kenyon in the middle of perfect possibility. So that is, uh, th those are the then poets. Uh, we'll move very quickly to the now poets, three poets who are, again, mid-career in the, in the prime of their, uh, we imagine, uh, the prime of their uh, writing lives. Uh, the first is Victoria Chang. Victoria did um, a BA in Asian Studies at U of M in, I believe, the late 80s, early 90s, came back and worked with MQR in the aughts, uh, edited uh, a, um, Issue. It was almost an anthology of Asian American poetry. Um, she is somebody who, in recent years, has just she's written a. She's in her early 50s. She's already written a handful, maybe a half dozen of poetry collections. She's written a YA novel, uh, a, a children's book, a memoir. She is the greatest literary citizen in America, says yes to everything, has taught for us up at Bear River the last couple of years, taught fabulous workshops. And she was profiled in The New Yorker about a year and a half ago. Not too many mid-career poets get New Yorker profiles. So this picture is from that profile. Uh, I love the names of her wiener dogs, ketchup and mustard. And, um, and I'll share just a quick poem of hers. This comes from uh, a collection of hers that came out uh, just a few years ago called Obit. Um, it followed her mother's death uh, and then followed with a little bit more distance also uh, her father's uh, stroke, which resulted in a lot of cognitive uh, difficulty. Uh, so the, poem, the poems are in some ways obits for her mother and for her father's brain, uh, but they're also obits for herself, for, as we see here, optimism, for appetite, for obituary, obituary writers themselves, on and on. It really reimagines what an obit might be, uh, but that's the constraint, that all the poems look like little newspaper columns, obituaries, and I'll read you this one. Optimism died on August 3rd, 2015, which is, by the way, the date of her mother's death, a slow death into a pavement. At what point does a raindrop accept its falling? The moment the cloud begins to buckle under it, or the moment the ground pierces it and breaks its shape. In December, my mother had her helper prepare a Chinese hot pot feast. My mother said it would probably, probably be her last Christmas. I laughed at her. She yelled at my father all night. I put a fish ball in my mouth. My optimism covered the whole ball as if the fish had never died, had never been gutted and rolled into a humiliating shape. To acknowledge death is to acknowledge that we must take another shape. I've been teaching this book the last few years uh, to my undergraduates um, here at, at U of M and asking them to do their own imitations of it, which they respond to marvelously. It's a book I just deeply, deeply, deeply uh, recommend to you. Our, our second quote unquote now poet uh, is just Winder Bellina, uh, who did an MFA here in the early aughts uh, and who also taught for us up at Bear River this uh, past year. I guess I should say quickly, Victoria Chang now teaches it. Uh, she's a professor in uh, Antioch, College, Antioch Universe, University's MFA program in Los Angeles. Just Winder Bellina is a professor at the University of Miami uh, in their MFA program. And um, Jez Winder's uh, poetry is fierce and funny and strange and political and entirely engaging. My, I, I love it. My students love it. And I was going to share with you a poem from uh, his most recently published collection, the 44th of July. But then I thought, you know, why not preview something that's on its way? So this is a book that will be coming out later this year, English as a Second Language and Other Poems from Copper Canyon Press. Um, I think it's scheduled for October of 2023. And this poem that I have on the screen here um, which is in the collection, appeared in The New Yorker uh, a handful of months ago. Uh, some of Jez Winder's poems are loud and full of language zipping and zapping and whatnot. This is a, a poem in a quieter register, ancestral poem. And so we settled upon the shore of a nasally Midwestern sea, governed by a moon that hung like a metal we'd won above the subdivision. Evenings, the starlings made an ecstatic calligraphy against the gloam, landed upon the slack black wires, our antique telephony rippling between their toes. 
From my vantage in a second story window of the split level ranch where we kept our things, I could see some moths mistake the neon heat of a blockbuster video sign to the west for home. Your Babaji watering the impatience in their beds beneath a local cosmos. Crisscross of the pinkening contrails, your BBG nursing her twilight chai in a patio chair. She said a thing then that made them laugh. The clouds like painted bulls tumbling across a cave wall in this, the only known record of these events. The, the, the ending uh, slightly chokes me up. I just, the idea of the delicacy of the moment that is lost, except for the poet being there to chronicle it, um, just like a cave wall painting that might have been lost. So that's just Winder Bellina. And then our last uh, poet, and then I'm going to sit down, last of the now poets, is Francine J. Harris. Francine is from Detroit. Uh, she uh, was here in the graduate program, the MFA program, from 2009 to, I think, 2011, maybe did a fellowship year in 2012, was teaching here through 2013, uh, is now a professor at the University of Houston, uh, which has a fabulous MFA program and also a PhD program in creative writing. She's going to be joining us at Bear River at the Writers' Conference this, um, this season, this Labor Day. We're running it a little later than we usually do. Uh, I can't wait to see her again. I remember her fondly from a decade ago. And uh, her poem, her, her book, uh, which I have here, Here is a Sweet Hand, won the uh, 2020 National Book Critics Circle Award for poetry. That's one of the three major prizes that a book of poetry can win, al along with the Pulitzer and the National Book Award. Uh, so I will quickly share uh, a poem, of a, a love poem by Francine that I love called Against Storm, Against Glib Thunder. When I was the red umbrella, her lover, I made a precision of hoist. We understood stairs, my girl. We waited the hall, its curse till the sky undid clouds, uncoiled in loose slip of rain, and I waited for the first hushed sun to pattern after a harp above her, a sure sign of song as tarp a sun against patter, against storm, against glib thunder, numble against chatter, rumble against chatter we rubbed. When I was the red umbrella, her lover, I made a precision of hoist and sold metal as a system of limb, as a static frigate to keep red guler pouch above her so she might know love as cover. Such awkward inflation and swarm below her that she might know the egg of warmth a nest of articulating spread without rust, without the gate of heavy chest to lift off her in the sun. When I was the red umbrella, her love, I made a precision of hoist among her. I stood down when she had an army of medals, when she claimed command, armed with finches, mad with rain. I would never invade any cover for shelter. I never put her country at thirst. I wanted to leave ranks loved or wet, depending on the map on which artillery she wanted posed. I snapped whenever, whenever she snapped. When I was the red umbrella, her love, I made a precision of hoist and got so good you couldn't see me erect. Prone, I arched like the snake of a vine, the bank of a tree limb. I gathered moisture from air and I put buds in her black wrath of hair. I wanted all bees to swim us, roped through breeze, our spiny ribs licked into a sway of combs they stung to. I wanted us open so she could see me drape. Let's all live long enough, enough to have someone write a love poem to us like that. Um, the, um, I was going to end with that, but then I thought, I'm going to show one last poem by uh, Francine because it makes me laugh. I thought this was a poem that she wrote after the 2016 election. She zoomed into my class uh, a few years ago and said, no, this is a 2008 poem. It's called The Meek. It's election day. It's the finest day in history. The air is crisp and the tone is full of hope. My party is weighing in early. There are victory flags in the sky. And the whole morning I am haunted by the memory of a lover who, at the end of everything, told me I had no ass. So that is not quite the end of everything, but it is the end of this, uh, this lecture. This last, this last slide is, uh, just consists of books that have been published in the last 
few years. Some of them are actually forthcoming. One's coming out in a week or two. One, one's coming out next year. But they're mo mostly books that have come out in the last few years, all by uh, U of M connected people. So just to show you how vital this, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the fertile, I guess, the ground still is. Uh, so we have books by Paisley Rechtel, Laura Kaziski, Linda Gregerson, Keith Taylor, Hala Matawa, Tung Wei Hu, Scott Beal, Lawrence Joseph, Avan Jordan, Mary Alice Daniel, Ara D. Matthews, Carlina Duan, Nate Marshall, Derek Austin, Petra Cuppers, Franny Choi, Katie Hartsock, Monica Rico, Sumita Chakraborty, Tarfia Faizula, Aaron Coleman, Vivi Francis, Denez Smith, and Richard Tillinghast. And again, these are just the last few years, and this is just all I could kind of fit on this slide. I could have, could have made more slides. So um, Michigan poets are, are doing okay. Thank you. Thank you, Cody. That was just fantastic. Really, uh, really great. There's so much there uh, that we could talk about. Uh, we could spend another hour and a half, I think. I think uh, so, yeah. Talking about a lot of this. Uh, first. Okay, okay. Sorry about that. Uh, so first of all, I don't know, I don't know if you know, I, I directed the planning for the university's bicentennial. And I'm sorry to say, this is the first I heard about the exhibit. Oh, but, uh, so I'm oh. sorry, to, uh, sorry to have missed that. It uh, must, must have been great. It, it was great, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I knew about the symposium mm -hmm. and so forth, but, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm, I'm glad to hear about the exhibit. So, you know, one of the things that struck me is you, is sort of, there, there's, there's I mean, almost a genealogical aspect to a lot of this. I mean, you talked about uh, Auden teaching Hayden mm -hmm. and uh, Hayden bringing Brodsky and so forth. And this is an unfair question because I know, first of all, this is just a small sample of Michigan poets. Mm -hmm. But is it possible to talk about a Michigan tradition or a Michigan ethos when it comes to, to poetry? Right, yeah, well, that is a great question, and I, I, I want to I say the answer is probably no, um, but it is interesting that, you know, poets are, I mean, I mean sometimes I make the joke that, all, to my students anyway, that all poets know each other, and the, uh, you know, poetry at a, at a certain level anyway, I guess, they just kind of bump into each other all the time, they're not, um, it's, you know, or at least they know each other over social media or whatnot, and they're connected. And I was thinking about the way that these poets that we're highlighting are connected, and some of them are connected in very kind of explicit ways. Auden was the teacher of Hayden. Um, the, um, I, uh, um, Vivi Francis has talked about her connection with Robert Frost. I mean, there, there are all sorts of kind of direct connections we can make, and these poets end up, as I said, being friends. Um, Auden and Hayden keep in touch for decades. Frost and Retke were not, did not know each other when they were here, but they end up being buddies, and Frost brings Retke to the Breadloaf Writers Conference, and the Auden and Frost end up knowing each other when they're both teaching in the uh, Northwest. Um, so there, there are lots of kind of personal connections. In terms of a kind of poetry, I think one of the things I like about, I know that I like about teaching this class is that um, it's so various. And I mean, this, what we have up on the screen right here, if you were to kind of go flipping through these books, you'd really feel that, just how different these poets are, their occupations, their concerns. Um, some are, uh, some use formal constraints, some are free verse poets, uh, some are looking outward, some are looking inward, some are, um, I, I sometimes when I teach more introductory classes, I talk about, and not even introductory, but any kind of class in poetry, I talk about the gestures that poets make, and there's the big kind of Whitmanian gesture, you know, uh, uh, that is, um, you know, I celebrate myself and sing myself, and what I shall assume, you too shall assume, and that's a gesture that, you know, Ginsburg picks up a hundred years later. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, and then you have the kind of the Emily Dickinson or the Robert Frost sort of um, the the rier more uh, irony laden kind of chin on fist gesture and um, I, we have gestures of all sorts among among these poets and we have 
we have Frost who does, you know, Frost things, uh, this, this kind of, um, you know, would suffice. Uh, and then we have, you know, Frank O'Hara, you know, oh, you know, the kangaroos and sequins and jujubes. And there's just, I mean, I, I, I really kind of treasure the fact that I can teach a class that feels like it's so confined, I guess. I'm only going to teach folks who happen to, you know, walk across campus once or twice, uh, that's going to really limit me, but it doesn't because it gives me such a wide variety of poets to introduce the students to. Uh, so that's my very long way of saying no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so say a little bit more about the class. I mean, one of the, one of the comments uh, in a discussion before, before, the, uh, before the talk, you said that uh, uh, students, uh, students seem to respond very well to Jane Kenyon, for uh -huh. instance. I mean, yeah. I mean, Things along those lines. I mean, what, what is it about Jane Kenyon that today's students are kind of uh, um, responding to? Yeah, I mean, I think a number of things. I mean, one is that her poems are relatively accessible, so you're not thinking, like, what is, they don't feel like a code you have to crack. She's telling you, you know, largely what's, what's in front of her or, or what's inside of her. And then I think the poems about what is inside of her, uh, she has a, a, a great long, she was bipolar, and she has a great long poem about uh, kind of a, having it out with melancholy. Um, that, um, you know, she's talking about uh, those mental health issues that not every poet was talking about in the 1970s and, and 1980s. She, uh, she died in 95. Uh, so I think, uh, I, know, I know students very much respond to that particular poem. I'm pretty sure I have the title right, Having It Out with Melancholy, I believe is the title of it. Um, but, um, but also just the, the strangeness and the associative leaps and the kind of uh, the, the wry turns that we saw to some extent in that poem otherwise. Uh, folks respond to for sure. Mm -hmm. So you covered a hundred years, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, you can't really envision, I suppose, uh, a poem by uh, Francine J. Harris being written in the 1920s. No, no. Uh, although you don't never, you, you don't really ever know what, who, who's the person who's going to sort of reshape the landscape all right. of a sudden. But but what do you see as? I mean, what are the big sort of the big changes in poetry over this hundred years? If that's yeah. another, another unfair. Question. I know. I, wow, <laughs> that's uh, in, in, let's see, it's uh, eight fourteen. Um, I, wow. Um, you know, I mean, I was thinking about that in terms of the. I mean, you know, if I went home this evening and wrote Fire and Ice, which uh, was written in the early 1920s, so you know, almost exactly 100 years ago, I would just be running down the street waving my arms. I, I would, I've, been, I've been happy in my life, right? But I, I, I don't think, I, I can't imagine being that <laughs> as happy as I would be if I wrote that poem. There are certain poems that we could look back on, or I do, and I say this is absolutely, you know, n n nothing it feels ancient or aged or, um, you know, that's how they thought about things then, but we know better now. Um, so in some ways, I'm attracted to those poems that, I mean, O'Hara's poems feel that way to me as well, um, that they could be written today. And I think that the, so this is a roundabout way to answer your question, but when I was thinking about Refugee Blues, um, the Auden poem, you just change a couple of you know, place details, essentially, and, and you have a poem that absolutely could be, you know, could be read today here or any number of other places. Um, so I'm not, sh this is a way of saying I'm not sure how to answer that question. I hope that there are, that w we can somehow find it, find a way to write some poems in 2023 that will be read in 2123 and someone, you know, won't be me, but somebody will be saying something similar like, oh, that poem that blah, blah, blah wrote back in 2023, you changed this detail or, or, or that, um, and, and it, still, uh, it still means something to us. It's still, I mean, I, those winter Sundays, I, people, there, there's nothing about, uh, I think, about that poem that's going to, you know, the poem that was written, a, you know, more than a half century ago that's going to not make people feel something 50 or 100 years from now. Um, so all I can say is I hope that we're writing some poems like that now that right. work similarly. Right, right. So I've been, I've been appreciating your poetry. And, uh, Thanks. Thank you. Uh, are there any, any of these poets uh, who have been particularly influential in your work or others? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of want to say all of them. Um, I, um, for a poet writing in 2023, I'd probably rhyme more than most poets do, so I'm interested in Frost's understated rhymes, um, Auden's sometimes loud, uh, you know, kind of exuberant rhymes, 
Uh, Hayden's, again, when he does rhyme, he doesn't always rhyme, but when he does, the kind of understated, enjammed rhymes that he's so good at. Um, Rutke, I love Rutke's uh, near light verse, I would call Dinky dark light verse. It's not just for kids, I hope. I, I love it deeply. It's got a dark kind of, you know, kind of shadow around the around its bright center. Um, so those, those so uh, Auden, Rutke, and Frost, probably are the poets that I've been most influenced by as a writer. Uh, I don't write much like O'Hara, but I kind of wish I did at times. I, I love reading him. Probably don't write much like Kenyon. I uh, love reading her. Same, same I think, goes for, um, goes for uh, Hayden. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the rhymesters probably, um, or not probably, but surely have had an influence on me. Would you would you read books? Uh, books? Yeah, yeah. I um. And then we can take some questions. Yeah, sure. So let me um. Well, I'll read I'll read a very short one and then a, a slightly longer one. That's uh, so I mentioned the um, the students saying how dare I say that Trump was like Hitler, and, and I said, well, I have a whole a poem that says he's not like Hitler. Um, this is that poem. Um, it's called Key Difference. Key Difference. I wouldn't lump Trump in with Hitler and Mussolini. Trump's Hands are littler, they're teeny, so there there are those hands. So that's uh, that's that. Um, and um, and then here's uh, here's one I thought I would read. Um, this is kind of a fun poem to read out loud, thinking about rhyme. I was thinking about this. This is a poem I wrote a decade ago, but um, it's called News That Stays News. So I guess it's appropriate that I wrote wrote it a decade ago and uh, read it now. That's a riff on what Pound said poetry was: news that stays news. Um, this was. Um, I wrote this when the sequester was in the news a decade ago, if anyone can remember that. It was in my mind a little bit re recently because of the debt ceiling uh, talks. So I just thought sequester was a funny word. Could I rhyme off of it? Could I make it into a double sonnet? Um, probably could. Uh, here it is, news that stays news. So I was talking to my friend Lester about the sequester. Lester's wife, Esther, was lost in a Norwester after leaving Lester for a clergyman turned carny who guessed her weight and then blessed her and caressed her and undressed her, a molester fumed Lester. Lester feels everything's beginning to fester. I asked what his students were reading this semester. He said, I don't know, infinite jest or you two can drum like Pete Best or what is this, a test or something? I tried to steer us back to the sequester, but then in walked Lester's sister, Hester. Hester's an investor in the Westchester Poetry Center's electromagnetic double sonnet tester. So I said, hey, Hester, I hate to pester you, but do you think you could run that tester over my poem featuring Lester and the sequester and God rest her soul, Esther? Later, Hester pressed up against me on her best or second best sofa bed. Please don't tell Lester. So that's, that's me and my rhymiest. Thank you, thank you. Uh, any, any questions from the audience? Yeah, question? Yeah. From, from, from online, Andrew. Andrew. Mary Workinger asks, did Frost write Acquainted with the Night in Ann Arbor, or is that just an apocryphal story? You know, that is a really interesting uh, question because I'm not entirely sure. There's lots of debate about that. Um, he said that he did, um, and he says it. I actually just read it. I brought all my books here uh, as kind of a, you know, I don't know, to feel safe. Um, and in, I think it's in Robert Frost speaking on campus, um, he mentions, uh, he, he talks about that um, l luminary, you know, kind of clock in the sky being, um, I'm not sure if I have the term right, but the, was it the Washtenaw County Courthouse or something that's no longer there that was replaced in the 50s, and he said he had that in mind and uh, says at one point he wrote the poem in Ann Arbor. Others have said he did not write the poem in Ann Arbor and may not even have had that, uh, that, that clock in, in mind. Um, so I don't really know, but it's been a, I've, I've, I've read about it, I've read the debate, uh, and um, I, I think the, probably the answer is that he said he did, and some folks who tracked down exactly what he was doing 40 years earlier, which he couldn't have probably remembered, think that maybe he didn't. <laughs> but, you know, Pop possibly at least had that clock in mind, even if he didn't write all the, all the verses in Ann Arbor. It's, fr it's from that time, that, from the early 20s. Questions in the house? Yep. Why will, you, will, you, will you hang on for the microphone so we can get people online, please? Thank you. Why do you think that the history of poetry in Michigan isn't super well known? 
I, I think because the history of poetry almost any place isn't super well known is the, you know, the kind of easy answer. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it's, there are a lot of things to do in the world. The, I mean, the Celtics and the Heat are playing tonight. There, there are other things you can do besides you know, read poetry, and, and certainly there are other things you can do besides read about the history of poetry. So I got here in 2009, and I, I didn't know this history very well until the bicentennial uh, you know, opportunity came around, and, and then I you know, took myself up to special collections and started reading and reading. The more I read, the more interested I got in it, and now it feels like a kind of a permanent part of my teaching um, you know, portfolio, perhaps anyway, a class that I'll come back to and I'll keep learning. Uh, you know, I wish to God I you know, had Larry Goldstein still to call on, but I, I do have Keith Taylor and uh, Linda Gregerson, who's been here since 1987, and others who, are, uh, you know, who very much know the history of, um, you know, some of it firsthand, of Poets of Michigan. So I'm, you know, I, I aim to be, a, I think, as, <laughs> as long as I can be anyway, a lifelong learner, um, but I don't imagine that there are too many people like me who are then going to use that in their teaching and to some extent in their art. So, um, you know, I just think there are a lot of things to do in the world. And um, I'm grateful to Gary for giving me the chance to talk about this, as you said, 100, no, 102 year history of, of Poets of Michigan. Um, but, you know, we can only do this every once in a while, right? Politics shows up in several of these poems, and you certainly don't shy away from politics in your uh, yeah. in your poetry. Uh, does do, do you think that, does poetry have any particular political function, or could it? Can it? I mean, I I hope it can. I mean, I you know, again, I, I think not much is the is the real answer, but it doesn't you know stop us from trying. <coughs> I think Auden. I know Auden has written some poems that have meant something to people in political terms. Um, I, I, I've at times been kind of very much a, a poet of the moment, or I'll just, I, I went from 19, from 19, uh, from 2015 to 2020, so for five years I wrote a poem every day, and that was my, you know, kind of, it became a gimmick or a shtick, and, you know, 99% of these poems weren't very good, but every day I wrote a poem that I, put on a private website that a few friends could look at just to hold me accountable. And, you know, this, again, most of it, most of the poems didn't do much other than maybe amuse me or amuse a few friends. But, you know, I got, I got this small book out of it. And um, it was a way for me to process and maybe for a, a very few, you know, readers of mine to process what was happening, which seemed, you know, kind of beyond imagining. Um, so for me personally, I think it was helpful to use poetry as a way to not just kind of pull what's left of my hair out. Um, and, and I think other writers and readers occasionally feel that. But, you know, I, I don't make any grand claims for uh, a poetry. As, um, I, what's it, um, the, um, oh, God, I'm drawing a blank on what's the famous Shelley quote about um, poets are the, um, who knows, at the... Uh, it's not the legislators of mankind, but it's something like that. Um, the unacknowledged legislators of, uh, of mankind and um, Auden, who, uh, you know, kind of called out claptrap when he saw it, uh, said, that's not poets, that's the secret police. <laughs> uh, so, you know, <laughs> take that as you will. Yeah. Yes, yes, over here. Speaking of legislators, um, could you comment on Amanda uh, Gorman? Gorman's poem being banned? Uh, being banned. Yeah, I mean, boy, that's I. Be, where where are you? I'm 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 sure it's banned all in all, all sorts of places. Where, where are you imagining specifically, or where do you? It, it is being banned. It's been banned in some states. Yeah, yeah. I mean, God, these days it seems like. Everything's being banned, right? Um, the, I mean, say again. Yesterday, the day before, we were in the school because they seen their parents. Okay, I didn't, I didn't see that. Um, but I, I, in Florida. In Florida, yeah, well, I, I, I certainly believe it. Um, I mean, I don't know what to say about that other than that it's heartbreaking, and I, I know that 
there was a time in my life where I thought I could uh, happily live anywhere in the U.S., and I'm not sure I'd feel that way anymore. I went to school at New College in Florida for a year, the school that's being turned into the Hillsdale College of the South or whatever DeSantis and his cronies are um, you know, aspiring for it to be. Um, that's heartbreaking for me. That was a really interesting and important uh, college, uh, college experience for me, and that college is going to be going to be gone soon, or at least gone in the way it was, and the idea of it, you know, you know, I, I, we don't have time probably to say what I have to think of, what I, what I think about it. Banning books, the English department put on a, a series of um, talks and small reading groups about banned books in the fall. I, I read a, I led a group on uh, Leaves of Grass, um, which has been banned from time to time, as you can imagine, over the years. Um, but yeah, the Amanda Gorman's poem, which I thought was lovely and performed so well at Biden's inauguration, um, that's heartbreaking to hear, but I, I, I miss that news story. Yeah, you, you, I mean, the, the, the thing that the English department did, I mean, those, those kinds of uh, uh, acts of uh, resistance or support are, are important, obviously. I think so. Uh, and I guess the, uh, the theme semester in LSA in the fall is going to be arts and, exactly. arts and resistance. Resistance, exactly, which yeah. Great, which is great. So, comment here? Yes. Thank you. This is actually a somewhat more cheery thing. Um, Gina Donlan in the stream just wanted to say thank you. That it, in the 80s, she had the pleasure of studying with the U of M visiting poet Galway Kinnell, and that program here has a reach and impact well beyond inspiring other poets. It inspires other lives. Would you agree with that? Uh, yes, <laughs> I'd, I'd like to, I'd like to anyway. Yeah, you know, I I guess was it? I, maybe um, this is. Uh, I'm trying to remember where I saw this. Maybe it may have, it may have been in Larry Goldstein's uh, piece in this Michigan Quarterly Review uh, issue on Poets of Michigan, talking about uh, Galway Cannell uh, and maybe Robert Hass as well, kind of selling out the Hill Auditorium, which is hard, hard to imagine any poet, maybe Amanda Gorman could do it, but uh, any, uh, you know, mo most poets. Um, it's, you know, I, I was joking uh, to Gary when I got here, I brought these, and I'll, let me just remind everybody, I brought these uh, pamphlets, uh, Frostbite and Frostbark, again, which I, if you're at all interested in Frost's time at, in Ann Arbor, I recommend you pick up. I have 29 copies of it, which is, I think, roughly the amount of people we have here, maybe. But the, um, I said that I, I'm so used to going to poetry readings where, you know, maybe the people in the audience are the people who came with me in my car. Um, my, my kids asked me how many people were going to be at the reading, at this, at this event. I said, well, at least three, because I was going to, you know, bring three. Um, so anyway, that, but I, yeah, I, I, I've heard that, uh, Cannell and, and Hass and others um, were drawing crowds back in, back in that day, and um, may it continue. Well, that and, oh, I'm sorry, one, one, one more question, I think. Uh, oh, I probably can talk loud enough. My husband always asks for my dial. <laughs> so, um, in 1978, I was a freshman at the University of Michigan, and they had this wonderful, um, this wonderful program. I don't think this is perfect. This wonderful program called uh, freshman seminars, mm -hmm. and um, I don't know if they're still doing that, but these were very small group classes that were um, taught by Professor Emeritus, mm -hmm. who were retired professors. Yeah. They were much, much experienced in their, um, in their work, and I always loved poetry. Thankfully, I had a parent that introduced me to that when I was very young, and it was life-changing for me, mm -hmm. because in that course, and I this was 78? 78. He, he, he yeah. probably, he would have been, unless he came back, he could I do something he special, he would have been just gone, but. Because he was talking about his friend, um, Robert Frost. Uh-huh. He, 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 he spoke about these poets. He, he knew Frost, Frost, yeah. And he knew Frost until life. Mm-hmm. And it was just. This, this is, Hall and Frost are on the cover of this issue of MQR. Yeah. And to the students, it was such a small, intimate group. And so I'm wondering about the students now mm -hmm. that are being taught in the midst of this chaotic world of ours, yeah. this very technical world of ours, mm -hmm. and what you're seeing in terms of their interest in the writing that's coming forward and what you see now, this is now, but what you see from like younger people and younger children, what, what do you see sort of? Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I love that question. And um, so I'm a, a, as a reader, I, I, as I said before, and, and as a sometimes writer, um, you know, fire and ice and the kind of these, you know, kind of crazy depressing uh, poems uh, kind of get me going. Uh, but as a teacher, um, I, I, I'm like that, that question is, again, the, as a teacher, what I'm seeing is I, I'm incredibly enthusiastic about, incredibly positive about. I, I, so I run the undergraduate creative writing program. I don't work with the graduate students so much other than I, I teach a pedagogy class that they're required to take. Um, but I don't, I don't work with them as poets so, so much. But the undergraduates, the ones who are um, interested in writing creative writing theses, I work with all of them. Uh, at least in, in the English department. There, there are certainly poets in other departments as well, but in the English department, and they are so, so, so good. Um, they have been, I mean, they are writing theses that are just miles ahead of where I was at 20, 21, 22 years uh, of age, and um, they're doing such good work that this year we decided we would open up the program. It, it had always had a hard cap of 14, because that was the number of... Uh, theses we imagine that a single person could direct. And so Keith Taylor, my, my predecessor in this job, um, ran it at 14 for many years. When I took it over, I ran it for, I've run it at 14 for the past five years, I think. And this year, we got so many applications that, uh, that were good, that seemed promising, that um, seemed to be the beginnings of books that I would want to read someday, um, that we've expanded, we've lifted that cap and brought in another um, you know, a, another instructor to help run the program. And, um, yeah, so I'm incredibly enthusiastic about, you know, kind of where an interest in creative writing and, and also, I, just, I guess I want to say, uh, talent in creative writing is right now from what I see. English apartment numbers, as you may know, are going down, 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 but creative writing numbers are going up, up, up. So, uh, in some ways, creative writing is helping to keep English afloat. We have a hundred plus creative writing minors in, uh, uh, in the English department and, and we, the next year we'll have, instead of 14, 22 thesis students um, and they're fabulous. Well, I think that's a great hopeful note to, uh, to, to yeah. wrap up on. Thank you so much, Cody. Oh, thank you, I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you to the audience, too, for your engagement. Um, our next Making Michigan is going to be June 8th, and it's titled Wolverine Writers 2. This is uh, Fire, Ice, and Rebirth. Oh, Sorry. There, wow! <laughs> this, was not, this was not planned. I'm coming back for that. <laughs> uh, but uh, we will have three people, Kim Clark, Deborah Holdship, and Lara Zeeland, talking about stories that they have published over the past year related to Michigan history. Thanks to Andrew Rutledge and to the Michigan media team. We're open Friday afternoons if you want to come visit. We are open uh, Friday nights for astronomy nights. Uh, and we are open now uh, for the next half hour or so if you want to go up to the observatory. Uh, the sky is clear. It's been a terrible winter and spring for observing, <laughs> but tonight we can. So please feel free to head up. Uh, thank you all. And uh, until we see you again, uh, stay, be safe, stay well, and keep hope. Thank you. Thank you.